So uh, welcome to the 21st episode of the Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest graduated St. Mary's. He then attended Temple University, where he earned his BBA, serving as the president of the student government and graduating top of his class. During his high school wrestling career, he accomplished to be a three-time Far East wrestling champion. After graduating university, he developed a unique English learning curriculum and founded Yabui School of English, providing English teaching and translation services. Later on, he assumed position of the head wrestling coach at his alma mater and led the team to win four consecutive Far East tournament titles for the first time in school history. In 2014, he was certified as Asia's first United World Wrestling Educator. As an educator, he supports in the development of national coaches, mainly in Asia and Oceania regions. Currently, he teaches the IB Economics course and Business Ethics as the High School Social Studies Department head at St. Mary's. Using his bilingual ability, he also serves as a chair of the International Relations Committee of the Japan Masters Wrestling Federation, as well as assists in UWW's coach education development projects and media translations. Welcome to the podcast, Chu. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Nick. So today, uh, our main focus is going to be your forte, wrestling, all about wrestling, you know, how it's affected you as well as you sort of promoting as well as explaining to me what real wrestling is. All right, off air, we briefly spoke a little bit about the WWF and WWE and how that's not real wrestling. So I hope to learn from you today a bit more about what you do. So um, jumping right into it, currently you're a educator and a wrestler. Where do you see sort of the overlaps within you know, what you do in the classroom? as well as what you do at the wrestling mat as a wrestling coach? I think there's a big overlap for me. When I first started teaching, I actually, when I first started teaching, I didn't, I wasn't uh, a certified teacher. I was like a part-time teacher subbing in and stuff like that. So I didn't really know much about teaching. So I just tried to, I guess, do what I thought was teaching, which is, you know, lecture, give them really hard tests and fail everybody, and, you know, be a tough teacher. Um, and then as the years progressed and I got my teaching certification, uh, and then I had a lot of other veteran teachers who helped me out to become a better teacher. The more I learned about teaching, the more I realized that, Hey, this is just, it's the same as coaching, you know? And then I think in the education world, there's a lot of movement towards, you know, involving coaching in the classroom, but that's what I am good at, you know? So I really, I, I tried to treat my students in the classroom, just like any uh, wrestler I have uh, in my room, you know, and it's really the same, you know, I make him do stuff. So in the, in the wrestling room, it, it might be a move that they're working on in the classroom. It might be a worksheet they're working on a problem they're trying to solve, you know, I watch, give them feedback, you know, make them do it again, you know, and I test them on it and the way I provide feedback and stuff like that. It's not so different from the way I coach, you know, how I set my goals with the, the class or with the team and how I motivate kids uh, disciplined kids. I, to me, there's a big overlap. And the moment I realized that classroom teaching is very similar to coaching, uh, I think it really improved my teaching a lot. Uh, and my uh, former principals, I, I think, saw that. I got a pretty good evaluation on how I improved my teaching. So, uh, yeah, there's a big overlap. And when it comes to wrestling, students who wrestle, students who don't, I've always wondered if there's a certain student profile who you think could gain more from wrestling than others. Um, no. Uh, one of the things that I always try to teach my wrestlers, our community, non-wrestlers, or when I try to recruit uh, kids or convince parents to wrestle, is that wrestling, uh, what makes wrestling very special and unique and different is that it's as fair of a sport that it can be and it gives every single kid an opportunity to uh to shine you know and shine doesn't mean always win championships but a, a chance to to develop uh themselves as a person you know a chance to be a part of something uh, so wrestling is really fair because uh for, for those people that know nothing about wrestling you know re first of all wrestling is um you got weight classes right you've got different weight classes uh, and the Far East, the league that we wrestle in, uh, the lightest, you know, weight class is uh, 101, 101 pounds, you know. Uh, so that's about, what, 46, 7 kilograms? 
and then yeah, the heavy guest is yeah is like 275 pounds wow. so we're trying to fill up those those weight classes right so when i see a kid walking down the hallway who's you know who might be like super unathletic you know no muscles piece of twig you know super short there's no way that kind of kid you know not no way but it's he's gonna have a really hard time trying to play basketball those are the types of kids that wrestling coaches want it's like you are a perfect fit you know i found my one-on-one pounder you know and because a lot of wrestlers in our league start wrestling middle school or high school you know it's easy to uh, it's much easier to catch up you know whereas basketball i think or soccer other sports you got kids who's been playing since you know three years old you know and when you start in high school it might not be very easy to to keep up so if you're unathletic if you don't if you don't have a lot of athletic talent you got no muscles wrestling's a perfect <laughs> sport for you that's what that's how i recruit kids and then a lot of parents will because of they have this image that all oh, wrestlers are you know, super bulky and tough you know they got this wwe image of wrestling which is totally not you know they always come up to me and says oh my son can't wrestle he doesn't have any muscles he's too weak blah blah, blah. and i it, it takes me a while to convince these parents parents say you know no believe me your kid is perfect and then you know a lot of times he turns up yeah he ends up being a champion you know or the the opposite of the spectrum would be you know if a kid's really overweight you know he, he weighs 250 pounds overweight he's not going to play soccer he's not going to go run 100 meters sprints you know on track and field uh but those are the kids again i go out and recruit that we need you, you we got a perfect weight class for you just learn a few moves and then maybe you win some matches and become a champ so i think in that way talent or physical ability doesn't really matter in wrestling so I, that's what i love about wrestling is it, it gives i think every kid a chance to shine as long as they're in the room i mean don't get me wrong practices are really hard but if they can overcome that you know if they have the will to overcome uh hardship and hard work i think everybody can gain as another proof we don't cut kids o other i think ball sports team sports have a certain number that they can have on their team but wrestling yeah. we don't cut Whereas, like, you, there's no benching. You don't get benched. And everybody wrestles, right? So uh, it, it's really fair, I think. That's really interesting. Yeah, I never realized just how much breadth there was in the weight class. They said 101 all the way to 275. Wow. Mm -hmm. so that's a lot. Yeah. yeah, I imagine you have a range of range of wrestlers, and as you said, it and it becomes fair because you're wrestling someone the same. You mentioned earlier about the really hard trainings. One thing I noticed. Um, when I was playing sports myself in high school, as wrestlers seemed to have a really close connection with each other, they, they'd always be very a close, cohesive group. What do you think makes wrestling unique in that sense? Because that sort of level of closeness, I did not see, you know, basketball teams and soccer teams. Yeah, I just... totally agree. Yeah, I think wrestlers, we, we do really pride uh, ourselves with uh, that kind of bond. And uh, wrestlers like to think we're special, right? Because wrestling is not a popular sport. <laughs> so we love to think that we're special and, and, and we're different. And, and I think we are. Uh, but to answer your question, nature of the sport, it's a contact sport. You know, when you're going in in the room and your practice routine is to just beat each other up, make each other's lives miserable, you know, throw each other, pin each other, you know, after that, after days and days of that, yeah, you're gonna have a special bond with the guys. You know, I think it's 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 unique. It's unique. It's it's weird. It's it's counterintuitive. You you might think that if you're beating each other up in the room, like you may not like each other. But you know, as a wrestler on the team, we know that we're trying to make each other better, right? It's it's mm -hmm. I think the ultimate. Like it, it, I always tell, I always say, um, wrestling is the ultimate team sport. A lot of people think it's an individual sport. And of course, you know, when you're out in the tournament, you're wrestling by yourself one on one. But uh, it's a team sport because when I go when I go out in the wrestling room, you know, we'll make a deal, right? We say, okay, you're gonna beat me up for the next five minutes, you know, as a drill. You know, you're gonna pin me, do whatever, and then I'm gonna I'm self-sacrificing myself to make you better. You know, I'm gonna take that pain, that suffering, that hard work for you, and the next five minutes you're gonna do it for me. You know, you're mm -hmm. gonna sacrifice yourself for me, you know, to get better, right? We're gonna push each other. You know, you you do something on me, I'm gonna get back at you. You know, that's that's I think the beauty of, of the sport 
is it's the ultimate self-sacrifice and it's the ultimate team sport. And as you said, yes, I've, I've seen many, many wrestlers that I coach go through that phase and really develop a very special bond. Interesting. Yeah. How it's an in individual sport. Yeah. As you said, it's also a team sport because I guess what goes on in training. So you wrestled yourself back, back in actually the same team you're coaching right now. During your time as a wrestler, what was the greatest challenge, either psychological or physical? Obviously, showing up to practice every day was hard. It's, and practice isn't fun. I, again, there's, it, it's very different <laughs> from ball sports. I'm, I'm not saying other sports aren't hard. I know the basketball team, soccer guys work out hard. But it's a different kind of, of hard. So, yeah, especially when you're a freshman, you know, you're a rookie, you, you're going to get beaten up every day in the, in the room, right? So showing up to practice every day was hard for me uh showing up to practice i hated practice i don't want to go to practice but i hated losing more mm -hmm. so that's why i show up because i know that these uh my senpais or upperclassmen guys would make me better that's hard i think wrestling matches when it comes close that's hard i get really nervous and i still do i get really nervous before matches that's hard. Some guys are okay with it. I'm not. I just, I just totally shut down before all my matches. Like I'm just sitting in the corner, you know, sitting down, like almost crying. Uh, so that's hard. In terms of matches that I remember, and I think this goes the same with all wrestlers. Wrestlers remember matches that was hard or they, they lost either. For me, I think psychologically hard uh, was my junior year. I uh, went to Far East down in Okinawa. We had a pretty good team, but we were down one guy, okay? So he, uh, he didn't make weight. And we had a, a dual meet. Dual meet is where a team is going against a team. It's different from an individual tournament. When we had a dual meet, we were wrestling uh, Kinnick, and I had won the individual tournament the day before. And then the next day, the third day, is the dual meet tournament with all the teams. So we were wrestling Kinnick. We were down one man. Now in a dual meet, you, you're basically in a dual meet, you're trying to score team points by the way you win or the way you lose. And the only way we were going to beat uh, Kinnick with one man down was that for, for me, for my weight class, I had to completely shut out my opponent, meaning mm. keep the score at zero. Because if he mm. scores a point on me, that actually, I lose team points because of that. I had wrestled this kid from Kinnick the day before, and I won by tech fall. I knew I could beat him, but it was 13 to three the day before. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't let that happen, right? <laughs> and I knew I couldn't really pin him. So mm -hmm. the only way I had to keep it 10-0 to get that maximum team points for the team to beat Kinnick in this duel. Um, to, for me, I think that was the most, I was the most focused, careful, uh, very meticulous about everything. So that was hard. I remember it was in a basketball gym with the mats out. Uh, they had the, uh, which, what do you call those, the basketball uh, scoreboards up on top to keep the scores. So I remember like constantly looking up at the score and the time. Hmm. And it, it felt like the six minute match felt like, I don't know, two hours. Like every yeah. time, like, oh, you know, five minutes, 30 seconds to go. Oh, still five minutes, 25 seconds to go. You know, and I had to be really, really careful about not getting scored. I couldn't make any mistakes so every single move i did it was just very very carefully you know i did i did all those so i remember that match very well after my match my captain pulled off a big upset against theirs their champion uh and then we beat Kinnick, and then we beat the team after that uh, see i don't even remember what team i wrestled after that because that that was yeah. more <laughs> you are uh, so then, yeah, that, yeah. yeah that year we ended up uh, winning the far east duel um so that was yeah, psychologically challenging. Physically, uh, there's another match I did my uh, senior year. Basically, again, the rules are different now, but I wrestled this kid. He was good. Uh, we tied after six minutes. And so back then we had to go overtime for another three minutes. Mm. So I wrestled nine minutes. That's a lot of wrestling. For the, I mean, how would you describe those six minutes for someone who, who doesn't wrestle? Like what, what does it equate to someone who's, never wrestled in their life i i think it'll feel like forever especially if they're not <laughs> very good i think it will feel like forever um and that match i tied i went for another three minutes and i still tied we still tied and then with the tiebreaker i won that match but i remember after that duel like physically i i couldn't get up physically i was on the chair 
I felt extremely dizzy. I, obviously, lack of uh, oxygen. Extremely dizzy. Wanted to throw up. I couldn't move for the. I, I couldn't move till the end of that loop. So that I think was physically tough. Nowadays, no, we don't go overtime. So nobody wrestles six nine minutes. But that's what Excellent. I was going to follow up on. So are those, uh, you said, you know, the rules change, the rules change. So one, you just mentioned no more three minutes, which as you said, is like a lifetime. And are there any other changes that have been made to basically avoid major exhaustion or injury? See, I don't think those rules were changed to avoid, uh, to prevent injury. Like, okay, mm -hmm. one, um, we generally follow the international wrestling rules. So if they change the rules big time, then, then we have our, our changes are reflected to our league too. And we tweak the rule a little bit. For example, like uh, the straight back suplex where you know, you're behind a guy and you throw him straight back. You know, mm. That's okay in international rules. But yeah. in our league, okay, it's a little bit dangerous, so we don't allow that. So there are some, some differences. But generally, the International Wrestling Federation call it the United World Wrestling, or UWW, that's the International Wrestling Federation. Uh, a lot of their rule changes is happening or has happened. There's been a lot of rule changes in the past. One, because uh, in 2013, uh, I don't know if you know, wrestling got kicked out of the Olympics. I vaguely recall this, yes. Wrestling got kicked out of the Olympics because basically uh, it was too boring to watch. Right. Mm. So to fight our way back into the Olympics, we may we changed our federation, uh, you know, from formerly we, we were known as FILA, F-I-L-A, to UWW. We changed leadership and we changed our coaching education pathway, stuff that I'm involved with. But and then the, the other thing we changed was was the rules. You know, so a lot of the rules were changed to make wrestling look more appealing or exciting to people. Mm. So. So why is it shorter? Because nobody's going to watch a nine-minute wrestling match. <laughs> I see. You know? so that's so, one change. It's shorter. Are, were there any other rule changes that were, you said, oh, trying to make it more exciting? Yeah, I, I really don't want to waste our audiences <laughs> hearing these rule changes. Big time. Like, it was, I mean, when I was wrestling, yeah, it was uh, two three-minute matches. Two three-minute matches, uh, and whoever has more points wins. Tech fall was 10, uh, pain was 10. Uh, and then after that, they changed it to a uh, three period, two, three, two minute period matches, trying to motivate, incentivize wrestlers to attack more. Because one of the biggest uh, thing is that wrestling is not exciting. Nothing happens in wrestling. So a lot of the rules change to incentivize wrestlers to attack, to take more risks. So back when I was wrestling, you take a guy down, right? You take a guy down and you go around behind him to get control. That was one point. Okay, now it's two. You know, if I throw, if I pick up a guy and throw him to his back, back then it was three points. Now it's five. You know, winning by a technical fall now is a whole different thing from winning a technical fall back when I was wrestling. So it seems like from a novice's point of view, it, it makes sense to me. I see parallels with, you know, the NBA, like setting a three-point line when they used to not be a three-point line, right? They got rid of the hand checks in order to make it easier for point guards to, you know, move around. So would you say this sort of revolution that happened in 2013 has been so far successful and if so like what 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 has been the major you know apart from these rule changes what have you witnessed change uh, especially domestically between 2013 and now overall i think it was better okay wrestling uh the international federation we did not make efforts to make the sport better because hey wrestling is wrestling it's the oldest sport known to mankind it's the first Olympic sport. It's always been in the Olympics. There's no way wrestling is going to that, – that didn't cross anybody's mind that wrestling wasn't going to be in the Olympics, right? So if you are number one all the time, like if you are uh, – if you've got – if you've earned a spot and that's never going to be taken away from you, uh, well, what incentive do you have to work hard? In 2013 when they kicked us out uh, on the IOC, you know – I don't want to say kick out. I mean, I, I guess you know, they, they decided that wrestling wasn't going to be an Olympic sport anymore. Yeah, there were some major changes. Some of them were really good. Some of them were really bad. But as a result, we see a lot more changes in media coverage, a lot more um, contents online that we can see. There's tons of uh, documentaries, videos, and you know, cool moves and interviews, stuff like that. There's a lot more media presence. There's uh, rules, yeah, changed many times. I think the rule we have now is fine. Um, there's a lot of promotion. 
uh, for the Olympics. Uh, for my, for, from what I'm involved in, uh, coaching education has changed from uh, before we had no coaching education pathway. There was none. We didn't do anything. And that's one of the things that the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, uh, told our former uh, institution was that, hey, uh, your sports is uh, not popular. You're not making any efforts. Uh, there's no gender equality. You, a ton of other things. Okay, there's no uh, uh, transparency within your uh, government uh, governance, uh, and then the other thing was you don't have an international international standard for coaching education. You you mentioned how you're heavily involved, especially with in, in Japan with this coaching and education. So what what exactly does your job entail, and how you said how you know there's these changes now, right, in regards to this standards of coaching. How has that changed, especially because you've seen sort of the pre-2013 era and now you're, you know, obviously a big part of the post-2013 era. What have yeah. been those changes in the coaching scenes? UWW, when, again, when wrestling was kicked out and we changed our federation name, we had to make changes to all, all those things, right? And then in terms of coaching education, so the IOC said, okay, you don't have a coaching education system where... For example, each um, national federation, so each country, you know, each country is going to have their own coaching education pathway, training systems, and that, that's fine. But there's really no set international standard for what is good coaching, for example, good coaching practices, you know, what we should do, we shouldn't do. Uh, it, it just wasn't standardized. So back into uh, 2013 and 2014, um, uh, the development team for UWW, I wasn't involved back then, uh, they wanted to um, develop a coaching pathway, where right? I set an international standard for coaching. Um, so they wanted to build a curriculum where national federations and national coaches can attend, but they can develop a curriculum, but they needed people to uh, run these cor courses and the curriculum for the national coaches. So in 2014, they had to develop what we call educators. So educators are the people who run these coaches, coaching courses for other coaches, right? So we had to, so basically a teacher. We had to have a teacher to, to yeah. have a curriculum. So 2014, uh, there was this big uh, coaching education uh, pathway development project, and they, they needed to train the first batch of educators so and from there they can start to uh, offer these coaching courses so the various people from around the world were selected and I applied uh, myself for it and I think the biggest difference is I think in wrestling it's very common it was very common that you learn from the best you know oh he's an Olympic champion he's gonna be my coach but I'm sure, Nick, you know that, you know, best teachers, best coaches aren't always the best athletes, right? Because Definitely. you as an athlete, your performance as an athlete really is not very similar, is not related to your coaching ability because coaching or teaching is a whole different skill set. So back, back then, I think it was common, oh, he's an Olympic champ, he's a two-time Olympic champ, he's a world champ, I'm going to learn from him. But that person may know nothing about coaching. He might actually suck at coaching because he doesn't know how to do it. That was a big difference. So when I applied for the position, I looked at their requirements. And nowhere in the requirements for the applicants did it say you have to be a world champion because that's the first thing they wanted to change. This is coaching education, not are you an Olympic champion, not are you a good wrestler. So this was a great opportunity for me. Okay, I'm not a world-class wrestler. I'm not an Olympian, you know, but I, had, I met all those attributes uh, that they, they required. Um, so I flew to Paris, France. That's where they had the... But so I'm the first group. I'm the first group of educators. There were 15 of us back then. Now we have more. I think now we have about over 200. That's how I started. If a country wants to host a coach's course, then they'll contact United World Wrestling. And then usually if it's in the Oceania, Asia area, because I'm close, they'll contact me. Say, hey, are you available to do this? You know, so I usually do this during the summer break. Wow. So it's, it's crazy how that event in 2013, you know, there's that saying how there's always an opportunity in crisis, but it seems like wrestling's bounced back. If I'm not mistaken, it was going to be in the Olympics 
and it, it, it managed to return, I guess. Just it, So it was only out for one Olympics? Yeah. Is that- no, no, no. It wasn't out. So it never they, 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 yeah, they, it was out after 2012, London Olympics. So 2013, mm-hmm. right? So they said, okay, in the next Olympics, wrestling wasn't going to be a core sport. But what that meant was we also had an opportunity. So we were kicked out. We weren't in the 2016 Olympics at that time. Mm-hmm. But then what we did was we like re-registered as a new sport. Oh, really? I didn't know that. We registered again. And then the no. and then and then the IOC had to make a decision what was gonna be the new you know, new sport for 2016. Or so we came back in 2016. So we didn't miss an Olympic. I guess okay, now that I think about it, okay, it was good. Okay, if the IOC's intention was to put us in a very vulnerable position and make us work to make the sport better, okay, it worked. But mm. I can't imagine if we if that if we weren't successful if we really were kicked out and you know as I said like wrestling is is fair in terms of the weight classes but it's also fair because every because it's the oldest sport known to mankind there's probably some form of wrestling in almost any country and what does it require for you to to have a wrestling program you just you just have to have a wrestling mat right it doesn't take much and some you know. Uh, poor countries or less developed countries, they don't even have a wrestling mat. They're wrestling on grass, dirt, you know. India is huge. They have a huge wrestling culture now there. They're pretty good. And a lot of these kids are wrestling on mud. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, you're kind of taking away uh, the sunshine or, you know, our argument for soccer fans because soccer fans are always saying, all you need is a ball. But you're basically saying you don't need anything at all. So it's sort of the true egalitarian <laughs> true sport that you know you can play anywhere yeah. and you have i think wrestling is one of the sports that has one of the most countries represented if the olympics is an event to decide who's the best athlete in the world well mm. but wrestling is a pretty easy one because almost everybody in the world is competing so we, we've been talking wrestling at the international level so at sort of the more localized level you currently coach high school wrestling um i coach another sport at the high school level a common topic that comes up in the american and international school is in places like japan you know you play the sport whatever you play all year whereas in this american system you have three seasons right fall season winter season spring season i was interested to hear from you what your position was in regards to the seasonal approach versus the all-year approach it depends. <laughs> okay, when you get a good question, you know, the go-to answer for teachers, it depends, right? You know, um, I think when people talk about, you know, which is better, you know, should a person play multiple sports or do one sport? I think that question itself is very, very narrow and it's, it's narrow and it's, it's vague. It's like, okay, what, what, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, what, what's your goal? Like for me, Okay, uh, I wrestled winter season, high school year, but I wanted to desperately be a Far East champ. Mm-hmm. And the only way I was going to do that because I was not talented is to work off season. So off season, I was going to wrestling gyms in Japan uh, to train. So I didn't play any sports the other season. But because that, that was my goal, right? But, you know, for another kid, he might love, you know, I got wrestlers who play baseball and wrestling. And they mm-hmm. love both sports. So those kids should play, you know, both, you know, or even if you love both sports, if you want to be a far East champ in wrestling, you know, maybe you might want to take a season off. So I think, you know, which is better really, really depends on the kid, the goal. And also it's not just that, that makes a good athlete. You also have to think about the environment that the athletes in, you know, you know, even if you play soccer for a whole season, I'm sorry, soccer for a whole year. If you have a crappy coach, you know, that's not going to make him much better. I think like teacher, coaches, parents, I think they should avoid some, some people that right, should avoid the tendency to look at a role model and like see what he or she has done. And then, you know, try to make him make your kid do that, you know, but th- that, that may have worked because of, because of him and the environment he was in. It might not work for your kid, right? You got to know so many different personalities, uh, environment that's that's involved. Almost infinite number of variables with human beings and kids, especially that you don't just change one thing and then think that it's going to work. The same with coaching too. Is like 
you know, some strong, you know, let's say the national team is doing this kind of workout and they won the Olympics. Am I going to make my kids do that same workout? No, because there's different needs, different objectives, different types of kids. Or some athletes are successful in that one year long training environment, whereas other kids need different, uh, I guess, stimuli, you know, different seasons, different sports. But again, just answering your question, it's like, I think if it's a, like Japanese schools have one year long program and mm-hmm. you're not really supposed to quit for three years. If they have quality coaching that keeps the kids motivated and develop and not burn out, I'm totally fine with one year long. But mm-hmm. if you're going to have a program for one whole year, for three years, the next three years, and all you do is go in, a little, for, in terms of wrestling, let's say, if all you do is going in there doing hard practices, not learning anything, and burning out, that's probably not a good way to do it. Like, I think in the US, it is by seasons, but some of the good wrestlers, you know, some really good wrestlers that we know now, Olympians, Olympic champs, you know, they played multiple sports. Football yeah. football in the autumn, wrestling in the winter, that's a very yeah. typical combination. But some other kids, uh, they wrestle at their school during the winter, and then during the spring, uh, they go to a wrestling gym. During the summer, they go to summer camps. And then the fall, they go weightlifting to prepare. Right? So they're basically wrestling all year round, but in different environments, different coaches, different stimuli. I think that's really good. Mm. And something that maybe Japanese education can also learn. So as we uh, wrap up this conversation today, I like to, at the end to have the guest basically talk for about a minute in regards to what is coming up in their lives in the next coming years, maybe even decades. So yeah, take it away, Shu. Um, okay, for me... Right now, what's really important is wrestling in the Far East is dying. Okay, it's dying, meaning we have fewer programs in the Far East. And then when you have fewer programs, uh, and then you have more and more of these coaches of these programs who don't stick. So a lot of the the military folks, they move around a lot. But I think a lot of teams are struggling to find a good coach and struggling to find, even if they do find a good coach, they don't stay long. And then you got less and less uh, programs, less and less kids are interested in wrestling. Like when I was wrestling, there was about 25 teams in the Far East. And we all came to Okinawa or, or Kinnick to you know, have this big competition. It was competitive. You never knew who would win the tournament. It was, you know, you might have some random kid from Korea win it that we never heard about some random kid from the Philippines or Guam, you know, it was really, really exciting. Level was really high, but mm. over the last decade or so, less programs, meaning, and, and less um, coaches, uh, less kids on a program. You know, some programs used to have 50, 60 kids on their program. Now they only have like five wrestling for me, because I can make that comparison when I was wrestling, uh, wrestling yeah. in the Far East is really dying. I do try to spend time in trying to make it better. Mm. That's a big thing. A, a lot of people tell me, you know, that I'm, I'm very successful as a coach, and and I'm grateful for that. But and I I have produced a lot of really good wrestlers, but it's also true that the level of the league has really really gone down. I can see that, right? So I I would not have been winning as much as I am right now had this been 20 years ago because the competition is high. So uh, for me, you know, I'm, I don't know, you never know what's going to happen. But for me, you know, I got two kids of my own. Uh, they're probably going to go to, uh, I got a son, so he's probably going to come to St. Mary's. And I got a daughter, probably going to go to St. San just because we live close. You know, I, I'm probably going to stay for a relatively long time. So during my duration, yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to make efforts to make wrestling uh, better uh, using my network connections. And I have been doing uh, you know, a lot of stuff to try to make it better, try to make it easier for new coaches to coach. So I'm, I'm essentially really helping out other teams to get better, which is kind of uh, uh, strange, but I, I don't want to, you know, what's going to happen 10 years down the line here? You know, we, we might only have like, I don't know, five teams. I don't want to be the champion of five teams yeah. that are really level. So in terms of wrestling, yeah, uh, I, I'd like to see it. I, I'd like to make it uh, better, at least to what it was when I was wrestling. Yeah, it's a pretty clear, concrete goal. 
helping other teams, making wrestling better. And um, yeah, thank you for being on the Tokyo Alumni Podcast, episode number 21. And um, yeah, it was quite educational for me in regards to wrestling because I've always heard about it, had friends involved, but I weren't quite sure what you guys are up to. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I always want to promote uh, wrestling because, yeah, because, yeah, it's not popular. Nobody knows really what it is. But I think once people get involved, they're hooked. You know, that's, that's the addictive nature of, of the sport. And I have many, many parents who are so against their son's wrestling because they don't know what the sport is. They're so against it, you know? Mm. Uh, but after a few years, they totally change. Now they're like big, big wrestling fans. They're going, they're flying overseas to watch wrestling tournaments and stuff, you know, donating stuff to our program. They're biggest wrestling fans. And I, I like, I love to see those kind of changes with, with the parents too, you know? Uh, in the wrestling community. Yeah, I see that big Titans flag in the back. Um, I wish your team the best of luck. Again, thanks for being on. And uh, yeah, hopefully our paths will cross again, especially because we're both educators. So I'm sure we'll, we'll see each other somewhere yeah. in a professional development or something. Definitely. Thank you. All right. Thanks for being on, Shu. And Thank goodbye. You.